Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Ground Truth Assumptions, Risk and Reward. A few logistical things before we get started. Uh, we are recording today's presentation. You can look for the video to be posted on LinkedIn in the next 10 days or so. Uh, we do encourage you to join some of our special interest groups that are linked here. We have two upcoming webinars that we would encourage you to register for, May 17th towards a shared understanding of market performance, and then June 14th, prioritizing opportunities for growth and expansion. We'll be sending you out the links to register for these after today's webinar. Questions will be hosted at the end of the presentation. Please type your questions into the question window. We will be monitoring there. If we don't get to any of your questions, we can follow up by email or you can reach out to us on LinkedIn after. I'll be your moderator today. My name is Kathleen Ojo. I'm the Commercial Programs Lead here at Esri. I'm here with Helen Thompson, who's the Commercial Industry Manager for Real Estate, Banking, Insurance, and Market Development. Uh, we're real happy you could join us today. And let's jump right into our topic. So why challenge your assumptions? Um, so the Cambridge definition of assumption is something that you accept as truth without question or proof, which doesn't sound like a great thing to do, of course, but assumptions are inevitable. We all make them, and we tend to seek out information that confirms them. Why do we do this? Well, because it makes life easier for us. Assumptions lend themselves to quick decision-making, but not always the most beneficial or strategic of decisions. It's easy to look at data on the surface and let your assumptions drive your decisions. So say you have your target audience in mind, you find a cluster of them living in a certain area, you drop your store down in the middle of that and you expect it to succeed. And in the absence of the tools and technology you need to mine more insights out of that data, sometimes that's the best you can do. But what if you take all the data that you have on your target audience, you normalize it, you index it against other variables, such as education and income level, and you view it on the map. You might realize that your optimal site selection is actually somewhere different. So it's good practice in work and in life, of course, to question your assumptions. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Helen, who's gonna dive deeper into this concept of ground truth and how rethinking your conventional approach is the key to innovation, differentiation, and creative problem solving. She'll be showing you some of the tools available to extract multiple layers of insight from your data. Helen? Thanks, Kathleen, and thank you for joining us wherever you are and whatever time zone it is. And also to those who are watching this in the recording, we very much welcome your attendance. I want to pick up on what Kathleen has just said and think about the assumptions that you make in everyday life. It's very easy to just go along thinking about the same things, um, really conforming with the previous predictions that you have because it makes life easy. I've worked with a lot of people in real estate and retail, in banking who really do the same thing, unfortunately. Um, one of my good friends sort of uh, always says, that would be a great place for a Starbucks. Starbucks is somebody that he's worked with a lot knows what the demographic looks like and every great opportunity as he sees it he tells me that um, he can't believe that a starbucks isn't there but he's making a lot of assumptions about the success that he's had with starbucks and working with starbucks and what starbucks actually wants and that might be a good thing because the developments that he's been involved in being very successful but really one of the things that's happening is he's got a confirmation bias. His previous experience, his belief, his preconceptions, they're grounding what he's currently doing. And to be successful, you really need to change the mindset. You need to adjust your methodologies and think about things in a different way. Because if you continue to have the expectation that nothing is going to change, then your outcomes will change. One of the things that confirmation bias does is it reflects the past and not necessarily the future. You know, we live in a very dynamic world. We know that things are changing. 
we know that the patterns of behavior and activity and demographics in our marketplaces and our market areas five years ago are not the same as we see today. So why would our understanding of the demographics and the conditions that would make a location successful still be true? And so one of the things that I really see is that having that confirmation bias, and we always have done it like this, I've been successful like this in the past, really prevents us from considering new or more important information. Now that might challenge our convictions. It might challenge us to look at something and say, well, that doesn't make sense. But one of the worst things you can do is ignore inconsistent information. Because when there's an inconsistency, it actually might be identifying the fact that you have confirmation bias, that you're looking for data to fit your preconceived outcomes so you notice when it doesn't fit. One of the tools to overcome this is actually something called normalization. That's the process of dividing one numeric attribute by another. So for example, looking at educational attainment, we can have the number of people with degrees or master's degrees. And that's a great variable. But if we normalize it against the population, we can count the percentage of people with a bachelor's degree or higher. That's a very different piece of insight because it's contextual. It allows us to understand the geographic distribution of a variable and how it's varying across different areas. We can understand how it's correlated with other variables that we can normalize in the same way. So does high educational attainment correlate with high income? Does high educational attainment correlate with where you live in the future or the value of your home? or any of these different conditions. By taking data and normalizing it, we create things which are obvious, percentages, proportions, indices. But what all of those measures allow us to do is to provide a standard set of contextual relationships between those different variables. It allows us a common frame of reference by which we can compare data and different variables to see which ones are actually correlated and how strong that correlation is. It allows us to score different variables in the same way. We can score it based on distribution. We can score it based on measures that we're looking for fit against a target set of conditions. And what it also allows us to do is to standardize analysis across different locations. So a simple example would be, I want a total number of people live in an area, let's say 20,000 people. Now, if I just go on the raw number, that condition will be very difficult in a small town. It'd be much easier to get in in a large urban city. But if I start to think about percentages, I want 5% or 30% of a population of which 20,000 represents 5%, I know immediately what my target audience needs to be. And I can start to think of things in context. And this is really important because a lot of data sets, when we're just looking at counts, really reflect numbers and populations. And let me show you this with some work we did recently around educational attainment. Here's a map of the US. And rather than just being the number of people in each one of these zip codes, we calculate the percent of the population with a graduate degree. And we can see how this varies across the, the country from 45% to under 7%. The darker the colors, the higher the percent of graduate degrees. Now we can see patterns in this immediately, we can see how people vary, which is very different from looking at the total number of graduate degrees, because we'd expect to see a very high concentration in some cities. So something that stands out for me immediately 
is in California, Los Angeles has a much lower number of graduate degrees than San Francisco. You'd expect that with Silicon Valley, but why does um, Los Angeles stand out with such lower percentage? We can look at hotspot analysis to try to tell us whether or not this is significant in terms of the concentrations. So what a hotspot analysis does is it looks at the geographic distribution of these areas and starts to identify clusters in which similar um, conditions exist amongst neighboring geographies. So in this case, zip codes. So there really is a significant concentration of graduate degrees in Silicon Valley. But if I zoom out, we can see other places with significant concentrations. So look at Colorado, very significant amount of hotspots in there. A lot of people moving up to the Colorado area. But we can also see cold spots, a lot of the Midwest, um, into the Southeast. These are places where there's lower than expected number of graduate degrees given the, the population. And there's a significant cluster up in the, in the Northeast between um, Boston, Maine, all the way down through um, Washington, Virginia. One of the other really great tools is to be able to take that and say, well, this is the macro level um, view of these, out, these hotspots. What if I look at the outliers below them? Tell me the places where I've got significant pockets essentially of opportunity. Where are the places where there's hot spots of high numbers of graduate degrees in areas where there's typically lower number? So we can see these blue zip codes in the red areas and the red zip codes in the, in the blue areas. So the blue are areas in which there's significant variation, um, cold spots, if you want, next to areas which are hot spots and vice versa. So what it shows us in this significant cold spot area in the southeast, there are a lot of hot spots of graduate degrees. These are the places where they have higher concentrations of graduate degrees than the other surrounding counties. Many of these are cities, we would expect, but some of them are actually up and coming counties and locations that many people wouldn't have expected. So let me switch back and tell you why we care about this. Outlier analysis is very significant because if we look at it purely from a statistical point of view, the outliers are typically at the end of the distribution. In this example with age, we can see that there's very few people aged over 85 and there's very few low, uh, young people. In a normal distribution, looking at this thing from a statistical perspective, the outliers will always be at the end. But using geographic outliers, we're looking at the variation in the geographic distribution. We're looking at hot spots and the way that those hot spots give way to cold spots. And this, be, this is the difference from an area and its neighbors. And it's not something that you can find using um, traditional statistical techniques that don't include the lens of location. This is a really powerful technique, which is often used by companies to spot uh, market opportunities, gaps, and underfulfilled markets. Hotspot analysis is something that really helps us ask questions in different ways. And I created this table to really show people the, the ways that we can bring together these different forms of analysis. So simple questions like, where are things clustered? And how intense is the clustering? That really correlates with the idea of saying, where are our top five areas that we could sell more in? Where are underperforming markets? Spatial outliers allow us to find anomalous um, patterns, it might be spending or in Los Angeles. It's these patterns of high demand in pockets of low demand. When we think about um, grouping analysis, 
it allows us to take these different attributes and characteristics and group a, uh, a set of locations and sites into a common number. So I could take 50 locations and say, how are these best grouped into three? Not just high, medium, and low, but the three that shows the most, most self-similarity. And by doing that group analysis, we find the characteristic the characteristics that best explain how those locations are performing. This is exploratory and explanatory data analysis. It tells us why these different locations are performing like they are, or what are the key attributes that we need to consider in our analysis. So an important idea behind all of this, looking at averages, we're pretty familiar with means and, and medians, and uh, we use them every day. But how we choose to use the mean or the median in our data sets and the attributes that um, Esri offers as part of our solutions can make a huge difference to the results that you get. Mean really should only be used in normal distributions. And in normal distributions, both the mean and the median will be approximately the same. The median is used for skewed data, and what that means is that the data is pulled in the direction of the tail. So think about, in my example of net worth, this is skewed to, to the left because there are far more people with a low net worth than there are with a high net worth. But if we look at the median value, the net worth is only 17,000. The average is skewed to the right because of all of those people, the percentage with very high numbers of, of high net worth. And that ends up coming out at 220,000. So generally one of the things we can do is to, is to use the mean and the median to understand the skew and then in the distribution. And that's quite important because it allows us to select the best type of measure of the distance and the variation in, a, in our data set. Are there outliers? Are there things about the data that we should take care about? So this little chart provides a guide for how we should use them. A lot of the data that we look at in demographic analysis tends to be skewed. Household income is positively skewed. And what that means is that the average, the mean income, will be higher than the median because the influence of very high incomes in the same way as net worth will pull that mean off to the right-hand side and will exaggerate the mean. So if you when you talk about what the average value is, be very aware about the types of variables that you're using. And so let's explore this um, for ourselves. I'm going to jump into Business Analyst, and I've done some analysis around Ezra's headquarters. I'm going to open it up, and I've created a standardized um, infographic which allows me to explore some of these different conditions. And the reason I'm doing this is I, I want to really understand the conditions around an area. Typically, we would summarize things into the median household income or the average household income. And you can see that within five minutes of us here at Esri, the median household income is, is about 20,000 less than the average household income. But look at net worth. It's, it's less than 10% of the average. The home value is relatively normally distributed, and you can see that reflected in the average and the medium value, the, the mean and the medium. And the um, age profile is, is relatively normal, but it tells us with the 85.0% here is that people are younger than the average age in the area. If we look at 10 minutes, things start to change again. 
now we're seeing that the home values start to shift. We see a lot more people with higher net worth. So although the median grows from a value of about 16,000 to 74,000, the average also expands significantly. Let me just go back and show you this. 16 and 222,000, and now it's at 75,000 and almost 700,000. So the gap between the median net worth and the average net worth is actually getting higher, it's getting bigger. So these are things to be, to be aware of and creating these types of infographics that allow you to explore the data and understand the distributions is really important because those numbers that you're getting back can be very influential in the type of analysis that you do. I want to introduce you to a great resource. The tapestry is often used to um, build on the back of this type of, of analysis. So these variables like household income, age, um, home value net worth are really key demographics. And what we've done is we've taken a lot of those in those key variables and we've summarized them for every one of the tapestry segments. In that table, which is available for, to download at this location, you can compare every single life mode and every single tapestry segment with the US. So you can see that um, we can compare in affluent estates. There are 12 million households also, about 35 million people, and we can see everything associated with that. We summarize this into um, about 30 different groups of attributes, which contain more than 75 individual variables. So let me jump in and show you this uh, running here in the, in the PDF. So we can compare anything that we want to. So if we look at the diversity index for the United States, it's 64. Uh, percent. So um, look at affluent estates. It's about 20 percent less diverse than the U.S., while upscale avenues has about the same degree of, of diversity. We can compare across all of these different attributes and all of these different life mode segments ways that we can understand what the average for that group might be. So if I look at Gen X Urban, uh, we can see that they're um, a, about 43 years of age, only about 20% of the population are under um, 18, which is a, just below the US average. 32% um, are uh, 18 to, to 44 and about 20% of this group are 65 and older. So these are, these are baby boomers. These are baby boomers uh, in many ways um, that have um, empty nests, right? They've um, got a particular characteristic and they're, they're living that style. But if we look at the segments below, there's often considerable variation within those individual segments. So if we start to drill down and look at comfortable empty nesters, they're eight years on average younger than the, than the Gen X um, life mode. In the same way, parks and recs are about eight years older. So one of the great things we can do with this table is also use this as a proxy to understand how all these different characteristics, these different segments and life modes come together. So going back to business analysts, some of you who watched the um, last video or attended um, our webinar will be familiar with this infographic that I, I built of tapestry segmentation. This allows me to compare those individual life groups against the US. So looking at the area around Esri, I see that people are younger than um, the county of San Bernardino. And I can also compare the distributions. So 43%, uh, sorry, 49.5% of all of the 
households in this area fit into our Midtown Singles Life Mode group. And they're represented by two predominant segments, the set to impress and the young and restless. And if we look at the top three segments here, I have about 65% or so of my population covered by just three tapestry segments. And I can drill in to really understand this. So we've got a lot of singles who are about 30 with a high school diploma living in the area, just starting off on their lives. We've got a, a lot of people that look like those that we hire at Esri, singles with college degrees um, that are um, just started on their first job, not just at Esri, but in other, other areas. And we can see how their incomes compare. And I want to give you a bit of caution about the um, household by income graphics that people often look at. This graphic always uses the same size to compare the, the, different, the differences between um, the geographies. So in this case, the Redlands Five Minutes and San Bernardino. So what it looks like is there's very high variance in some of these. And that's true. We have 5% difference in the income between 35 and 50,000 and four um, between 75 and 99. But when I zoom out, some of these numbers are not as big. You can see in here now it's only 2.2%, but it used the same size scale bar as when we were looking at five. So I was a little frustrated by this and decided that I would create my own visualizer for data like this, a way of really trying to score areas using a whole range of different indices. Because one of the things that I often find is that I'm looking for a particular age, and I might be looking for people aged between you know, 30 and 35. I'm looking for a particular income. And I'm very interested in the distribution, plus or minus one standard deviation, or plus or minus one year. And it's very hard, in fact, it's impossible to create a chart which, in, which includes variables which vary by one year or a tenth of a year, a thousand, ten, and, a, and up to a hundred thousand. So incomes vary by the hundreds of thousands on average, home values by similar numbers, um, net worth. So what I really wanted to do was create a, a graphic which allowed me to visualize this almost instantaneously. And it's great because as I move around to the different areas, this sound mixer style dashboard is a throwback to my 1980s where I was mixing music. I can instantaneously see how these patterns are performing. And we can, we can see the, the um, wave of, if you want, sound, which are these different variables. So very quickly, go back and look at five. Most of my variables are very low. Right? There's only a, a two which are around the numbers that I'm looking at in the positive, in the green. As we zoom out to 10 minutes, we can see there's this almost a V shape. Right? Some of them are very positive, some of them below. And it's very easy to, to really understand now how all those different variables correlate and meet my target numbers. And this has become very important to me and many of the people that I work with in terms of understanding the correlation between different numbers and the, and the variables that they represent. So if I'm looking for 10% more than the average, I can simply reference that as an index or a score in my slider and use the conditional tests in Business Analyst Web to build this type of infographic. And for all of those that um, have attended, I'm going to send you um, out a link for where to download these different uh, graphics so you can build your own version of this. And, uh, and if enough of you hassle me, um, I will get the business analyst team to include this type of infographic in the, um, in the business analyst product because after more than 90% of you 
asked to have the tapestry infographic included in Business Analyst Web, I'm really delighted to tell you that it's going to become a standard infographic in the next release. So power to the people. So let me jump out of this and show you some other ways that I use this type of analysis, which is site suitability. So I'm going to include a couple of other locations that might have been familiar with from our previous uh, webinar, which is the Redlands and the Riverside Toys R Us locations. And in this example, what I want to do is test how well the sites meet a criteria for a coffee shop. So I'm going to go in and use the crate maps for an area and the site suitability option. What this will allow us to do is to use those three locations as the foundations for my analysis. So we've added them to the map. And now what I want to do is I want to pick some criteria. And I've previously come in here and set up some criteria and I'm just going to use that criteria to do my to be, do my analysis. And in this example what I'm using is household income, total population, meals at restaurants, the bachelor's degree example I showed you, and millennials. And I've set up different weights associated with that. So I know that a store will always perform well if I have a large population. So what I want to do is I want to set the weight for the population itself to be one of the lowest performing values which is going to influence my site selection. Similarly, I want meals at restaurants and millennials to be very high. So I've distributed it based on that basis. From the analysis I just showed you, I know that income doesn't necessarily correlate with millennials, right? That, that income is something which is, which is highly variable. So using those different criteria, I can see how well the different stores are performing. But what also makes a very significant difference is when I start to look at the indices associated with this rather than just the raw numbers. So look at the current top three performing stores, Toys R Us Redlands, Esri HQ, and Toys R Us Riverside. If I change millennials not to be the total number in the area, which is really a reflection of the distribution of, of young people in the population, but the percentage, which is how they're distributed and where they're distributed in the area, Esri goes from number one to number three in the 15 minute drive time. But if I look at five minutes, Esri is actually the number one. So for a commodity product like coffee, having all of those millennials in the area makes a very, very significant difference. And having the highest concentration of millennials also influences my results. If we look at the number of meals at a restaurant, again, that's affected by population. So what I'm interested in is how many meals out on average do people eat? And that's going to be using an index. So is it higher than the US average? Is it higher than another area that I'm looking at, like California or San Bernardino County, or the Redlands market itself? And what you see is that now Esri scores 0.8 on this number. Let me show you again. Right. Without it, it scores 6.8. By using the index, it scores 8.4. And it also has an impact on the second and, and third locations. So my next best alternative changes from Riverside, which has access to a very large population within the five minute drive time, compared with Redlands, which has a smaller group, but it actually has more people in that area that want to eat out in restaurants. So understanding how to use means, how to use indices, how to generate these and look at all of the different um, numbers and attributes and how they relate can really have a very significant impact on the analysis 
than the results that you get out. So when somebody has told you that this location scores eight out of 10, you should question how they came about that number. What is it that made it different? So this is about fundamentally challenging all the assumptions and the biases that you might have in your organization because we intrinsically do have those bias. We have bias because of our experience, our prior assumptions. So what I would encourage you to do is to isolate and test the validity of the assumptions that are being made. Are you running analysis in that Starbucks example just using population? Are you assuming that population is the one thing that will make it the most successful? Should you be thinking about different age ranges, different segments, different life modes associated with that? If the data repeatedly disproves your analysis, don't go tinkering with the data. Go tinker with your thinking, right? Your thinking is probably not valid if the data keeps proving you wrong, right? The one thing that doesn't lie is data. And one of the things I really encourage you to do is to experiment and, and explore. I build infographics to help me understand what's going on behind this. I continually innovate in terms of my ideas because innovation precedes discovery and the identification of opportunity. Something that I was taught nearly 30 years ago is this idea of challenging your assumptions by using the reverse assumption model. And that is to fundamentally say, if I'm making this assumption, if I look at it backwards, will it still hold true? So one of the common examples is that every restaurant needs a menu. So therefore, you can only run restaurants if you have a menu. But if you fundamentally say, I can run a restaurant without menus, you're now forced to look at it from a new perspective and challenge how you will accompany that. Do you have a day board? Do you create your food uh, in a different way? Can you introduce your um, customers to the range of possibilities in a different way? The whole idea is to write down the challenges that you have and come up with solutions to achieve that outcome. And it will guarantee that you will think about your assumptions differently. And so also test your truths on others. Do they agree with you? Does everybody agree that that location would make a great place um, for a Starbucks? Because in the end, your data is trying to tell you something. So listen to it. So I want to close with a couple of examples that you can go away and explore for yourselves. The um, Toys R Us example is hosted on our Media Maps um, website. You can go and explore that for, for yourself using this link. The Graduate Degree Hotspot map is also available. Um, go explore your location. There are incredible patterns to be discovered both in the percentages and the hotspots and the outliers. You'll be surprised by some of the areas which are outliers. I also think you'll be surprised by some of the areas that have far lower total percentage of graduate degrees than most people's assumptions. The soundboard example is, is up there. And then there's a couple of story maps which I would encourage you to, to look at. There's one called the Geography of Online Lending, which I worked with uh, a great friend on um, with the, when we start off with a hypothesis that robot lenders are driven by uh, an assumption so that robot lending is not necessarily fair that there are rules which are which you can identify through geographic methods and there's a story map which explains how we tested this hypothesis and developed into some very insightful maps and a great story map for just looking at in terms of understanding how to use incomes is this one here. So I encourage you to get on and have a look at those. And now I'm going to hand it back to Kathleen. Thank you, Helen.
Uh, all the links you see here will be sent out to you in an email after this webinar is over. So we do encourage you to check these out, uh, especially the soundboard one. This was my first look at that, and I got to say that was that's pretty clever. Now we're going to switch over to some questions that came in during the course of the webinar. Let's start with where can I get the tapestry infographic? So as I, I said, the tapestry infographic will be um, released in the um, next release of Business Analyst um, online. But if you want to create your own, most of the widgets are actually just standard infographics um, in the current release of Business Analyst web. And all you need to do is to create your own version of the, of the color table. That's, that's there, and um, I was going to write it up as a, as a blog, um, but uh, maybe one of the things I'll do is host a webinar in, in the future where um, I'll show you how to build these types of infographics. Excellent. All right, how about where can I learn more about hotspot analysis? Well, um, there's a pretty good resource that um, I can I can take you to. Uh, we've we've built a set of um, easy easy lessons for people to get started with um, Esri and uh, the, the whole ArcGIS platform, and it's under the EsriURL.com/analysis, and it's a page of of information on, on applied analytics. It contains a lot of references to, to story maps and to uh, the MOOCs and, and the blogs. And I would just encourage people to, to explore the resources which are, which are here. And also, you know, just go and, and look at ArcGIS hotspot analysis. It's available in ArcGIS online. Um, it's available in some of the, the courses. Uh, there's a lot of resources to get you started. Fantastic. Let's go to another question. Where's the tapestry table? I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I apologize. It's, it, it isn't um, easy to to find. Um, it's on our, our downloads page. And um, the way to... Um, to find it is to look in the um, in the documentation uh, associated with uh, with tapestry. So the there's a great um, tapestry page and the documentation um, docs.artgs.com. And if you jump to the other resources it's under the the data page and other resources. There's the the poster, and there's these different uh, summary tables, including a different view of the tapestry summary, which is based on life mode, uh, not life modes, but actually urbanization groupings. And this one, what it does is it actually groups all the different tapestry segments into where those people live. So the people that live in urban centers, those that live in the suburban areas, metro cities. So this is a really fascinating one if you're involved in analysis looking at um, rural, suburban, ex-urban urban areas. Fantastic. All right, let's go to a couple um, little more content-related questions that came in. Why aren't income and wealth correlated? So there's a couple of different reasons um, associated with that. And think about our own um, experiences. So if you retire, you don't have any income. When you're under 18 and not working, you, you don't have any income. So immediately, people that have retired or people that aren't working, they won't have income. So out of the whole population, that will affect the, the average income, the median income in, in the area. 
The other thing is, as we go through life, we acquire wealth. So most people aren't wealthy when they're young. They might be acquiring high incomes, but in your life journey, you're doing things like buying cars, paying for kids at college, I know that one very well, <laughs> having a mortgage. So all of those things will affect both your net worth and, and your income. So the two things don't really correlate. Um, and they're especially true when you look at some of these different tapestry segments because they're a reflection of people's lifestyle, people's life mode and people's locations. Okay, and can you show how to save suitability criteria in Business Analyst? Yeah, let, let me just um, go back to um, Business Analyst and, and do that. Uh, what you might have, have seen when I was using the weighting is down here um, is actually a Save Criteria button, and that allows me to set this up, and I'll call this... Um, brown coffee this time and that's automatically now saved so when you set up the criteria or when you pick the sites uh, associated with that when you click the next button one of the ideas you can add or replace the criteria associated with that you can browse from the data variables using attributes on a site um, new features using competitive layer, or you can just use um, a previous uh, save set of criteria. And you can save with the criteria the percentage of distributions. And if you want, you can add an individual variable from those criteria. And one of the things that I really like with this is when you've done the analysis, is that you can export there, so I can take all my data, I can export it out to Excel, but I can also export it to a site suitability layer, and that will be um, shared out in terms of a new layer in, in Business Analyst, which I can come back and look at later. And so when I come back in now, I will have a layer which is being created uh, for me to explore and, and analyze. And this is a really great thing to be able to do because it allows me to, to perform analysis, save it again and again and again. Excellent. Thank you, Helen. Well, we're about out of time today. So if there's any questions we didn't get to, again, we can follow up with you via email or LinkedIn. Uh, we do encourage you to reach out and connect with us on LinkedIn. We promote our webinars, and um, we're always posting other information there. There will also be a survey that pops up for you once you log out of this webinar. We do encourage you to complete that. Um, it really helps us with both planning for future webinars and learning the kind of things that you want to learn about and that you want to see in Business Analyst and some of our other applications. Uh, we do take your feedback very seriously, and it does uh, inform our decisions in the future. So thank you very much for attending. We hope to see you at our next webinar on May 17th. Thank you all, and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.